All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Justin. I'm the founder at paidadvertising.com. And today I'm joined by Mr. Dennis, the creative legend who's been savage on Twitter with uh, working with brands like Obvi, 30 active brands actually with his creative agency. He's also founded Creative Donuts, um, a business that sells creative templates, which I've heard a lot of good things about from agency owners and brands alike that I've known using his templates. Dennis, welcome. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Justin. It's uh, I know we know each other for a couple of years now, and uh, it's good to uh, hop on the channel and chat about everything, uh, creatives, ads, agency, etc. Love it. Yeah, no, I know that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this like your first pod or have you ever appeared on a podcast? Not really, no. Um, I think it's the first one. Yeah, uh, I have right. my own YouTube channel, just been starting it up. But uh, yeah, not really like a big pod guy. Yeah, well, so, we'll, yeah. we'll leave the link to that in the in the description so that people For can sure. uh, check you out out there. But uh, glad that we have this one on the books. Um, that said, I wanted to bring you on board because a big topic I've had on the channel for the last couple of months is the creative side. I've been claiming in this kind of tagline that I've had now for the agency, our kind of mission statement has changed. The creative is the tar is the new targeting. So that's really been the message I've been preaching. And I know you've adopted that angle um, quite early in this space. So I'm actually curious, like, what did you see in the market? And why did you hone in on creatives as a positioning for your agency? Yeah, yeah. like, um, when I started, it was just like doing ads and asking our clients to get new creatives every week. It was uh, probably the same story with you guys as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I think after iOS changes uh, in 2021, then I really started the shift happening, not like immediately but i think in the next one or two years after the ios changes and that just really um i saw the demand rising for actually people that can be creative because as you just mentioned like the creative is the new targeting and uh, for us that holds true as well and for me it just really um has given me a lot of opportunities at the agency as a lot of our clients previously we just ran the ads and now more than half of our clients are just creative only where we help them with creative static ads video ads um you name it and for us what i saw changing is just like um, the platforms itself and for us just honing in on the attention grabbing uh, static ads video ads just really changed the game for us because we know like um, when building out my creative team internally at the agency i saw that when I added those team members, we saw our results like improve as well. And that just really helped us um, hone in on that market and deliver better results for the clients ultimately, which um, which is the end goal that we have at our agency, whether because like targeting isn't a thing anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously still people use it here and there, or they might do some like media buying hacks, but ultimately it won't give you the consistent results that good creative will bring you. And for me, that's, that's the main point. Yeah. I, I think we bought a lot on that. And one thing I, I wanted to potentially hone in on was how difficult was making that transition from being like media buying alone to creative side, because it's a lot more complex from an agency standpoint, like you need a lot more manpower systems have to be more dialed in. So how hard was that transition for you? Yeah, I think in the beginning, it was just hiring like, um, uh, like an editor slash static designer in the beginning that just helped out with some designs for our clients. Even like prior to iOS, like we had like a person that uh, has been with us for a couple of years and has been great. And after we brought on some more clients, we just um, increased our team. And right now we're at five or I think six video editors and static ad designers at our agency. Um, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that big of a struggle of course you will go through some people that aren't a good fit um mm -hmm. and it's it's really hard sometimes when you start working on a brand and you want to articulate their brand values um some brands can be picky some brands cannot be picky um so for us just really focusing on the quality and we've been in that trap before don't get me wrong like we mm -hmm. um we always feel the rush of producing quality creatives and then we might prioritize a bit more volume or like quantity over quality and then the results will suffer a bit um but yeah it's just about like the quality over the quantity and if you can produce like nine ads a week for some clients we put, like the, the most package we we do is like nine ads a week so that's three dynamic tests um that's mm -hmm. been working really well for us that volume and of course if you spend more you will ramp up that creative volume. But if, if you can really nail that down and put out quality well 
backed by research ads, that's just a real game changer for us. Love it. And in that sense, you mentioned earlier that more than half of your clients now are uh, creative focused. So the other half, are you doing like TikTok only? Are you meta or like how are you handling these clients? Yeah, it's um, it's paid media. So whether it's TikTok, uh, TikTok and Meta or Meta alone, like that's just what we focus on. And then we also do a hybrid of paid media management and also creatives. It's ultimately our preferred way because we have full control and our internal teams can like chat to each other. Like, oh, we see this working and let's make an iteration. And like in a couple of hours, an iteration can be made and we can launch it right away. So that's mm -hmm. works just really well for us. But obviously sometimes uh, a brand will come to us and say like, oh, we uh, already have a team in place, internal or another agency. We just need you to produce new ads. And that's what we've seen like recently pop up more where brands come to us and say like, Media buying right now, it's not that difficult. I do it myself or I have like uh, somebody on my team do it. We just need fresh ideas uh, to pump out in our ad accounts and just scale that way. Love it. And that was actually a question that I was meaning to ask you, which was how do you keep like accountable for KPIs uh, given that a media buying team is involved, right? There's like another third party out here. Would it be internal? So would it be like an internal media buyer, the brand owner himself doing it or like another agency handling media buying? How do you keep track of KPIs? Do you still have access to the client's ad account, even though you're not doing media buying? Or like, how do you track this? Yeah, we always get access to the ad account. So we have our um, motion we use um, within our agency yeah. to track the uh, the results uh, or triple well as well. Um, we use those two usually. And of course, the ad account still. Um, and we connect those to our agency account. And then we just analyze the creative that we made. We ask them to use certain um, naming conventions and from there we uh, analyze our ads and we can filter them and see how they perform against their current uh, current ads so yeah it, um, it does work well preferably we run the ads as well because we can do our own uh, stuff as sometimes you'll run into an agency that you think ah, oh, that's not really how i would have done it but uh, yeah it's uh, it's it can all work yeah hmm. and selfishly i'll ask you a question about that because i feel like one reflection i always have when working with potential prospects that speak to us for creative packages alone, um, they, they'll often talk to me about exactly what you said, which is like, well, media buying isn't that much. Like, mm -hmm. uh, all we want you guys is to still stay accountable for the KPIs. And then I'm like, well, if it isn't that much, then why don't we do the media buying, right? It's like, it's the mm -hmm. small little bit that we can just add to the package. It'll just make everything simpler on your end. Perfect. How do you, how do you see that? Yeah, um, now you really uh, brought some value to me as well. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's a great point to, uh, yeah. to take out for me as well today. Um, but yeah, sometimes I just think like, oh, let's let's just make greatest. Like ultimately, yeah. I do agree with them. It's 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 very simple, um, mm -hmm. and it adds a bit less complexity on our team as well. Um, so I agree. Yeah, I would say yeah, it's a it's a solid point on your end. Yeah, no, that's that's something I, anyways to think about. And I think brand yeah. owners too, sometimes it's like, although it's an argument for one side to say, well, we only need creatives. I'm like, well, if it's that simple, then might be even simpler if we just handle it. But Or they just say to us like, uh, I just want you guys to work on the creatives and have yeah. your focus on that and give us the uh, creative ideas that you have. So we can just um, do that and you can just focus on the, uh, exactly. the creativity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Love it. And I don't know if you can publicly talk about that today, but um, I've obviously seen your work with uh, Nick Dario on uh, Icon's account during Black Friday. Is that mm -hmm. a case study you can briefly touch on today? Um, not like numbers, like specifically. Yeah. I won't like delve into that, but yeah, we've been really crushing it for them, uh, working together with them for a couple of years now. And uh, yeah, we've helped them uh, scale well into the seven figures during black friday um with tiktok being a very good percentage of that spent i would say like uh in one certain day we were spending like a couple like i would say like 20 to 40k a day uh on tiktok so uh at the at the highest point uh at a pretty pretty good uh yeah pretty good roas um i think it was like a four or five ROAS. So that was nice. done really well during that period. Of course, like it's not just Black Friday, but um, yeah, it, like the strategy starts like months ahead or a month mm -hmm. ahead or something with uh, the, the paid media stuff. But uh, yeah, For just sure. with TikTok um, and like these events, like it's all about lead generation, as you know, like mm -hmm. warming up, 
during before that event and uh, just pumping out a ton of creatives as you know TikTok the the creative shelf life is just so short uh, compared to meta even and that's just for us just pumping out the volume um remixing as a brand like that like a an eight figure brand they always already have a bunch of assets and we just come in and pump out like a lot of like creatives for them and just uh, remixing a lot, which really, uh, really helps just uh, build that TikTok machine basically. And how do you increase the shelf life of creatives? Cause that's uh, very interesting. I've heard that from a lot of my own paid ad students from a lot of clients also just, it's known that you publish an ad on TikTok, it'll die out much quicker than it does on Facebook. So why do you think that is? Yeah, I think, um, uh, I'm not sure why, because that's a very, uh, yeah, very, technical question I, <laughs> yeah yeah um, because it's just an app platform like why doesn't that die out um but yeah, it might be something with the algorithm not that technical um so in terms of like how we can tackle that like we yeah. we make different variations very very quickly so we uh, have like more creative output on tiktok compared to meta um we would create like yeah, depending on the on the ad spend of course all the way from nine videos a week to like 40 videos a week, depending on the on the ad spend. Um, and then just it's the hook will change or we just mm. slightly change the, the script or we'll have a voiceover that's already working and we just change the, the B-roll shots. Um, and through that, we can just tap into different uh, different audiences, depending on the hook, of course, we'll change the hook, like the hook might tackle one problem and we change it to another, uh, which still fits in with the body of the video, of course, to make sure the entire video makes sense. And from there, we'll just, uh, yeah, basically tackle that. And um, yeah, and also maybe a bit of like um, gold here as well for the audience to take away from this video. We've seen really good results using image ads on TikTok. You might not like hmm. uh, think like, oh, that, that, that could work, but it really does image ads and just doing like a carousel on TikTok or you, you can also do like these, um, how do you call it? These catalog ads. And if you have yeah. like a lot of products, like I would say 50 plus or hundred plus products, catalog ads can really do well for more warmer audience, of course, because it's just like a product image in the end and not like a video that you will see on TikTok. They can, uh, they can really crush it. And I've seen some amazing results uh, doing that. Love it. Love it. Awesome. And take us through that process, I guess that creative process of yours, right? Because people know you for static ads. I'd say a lot with, with creative mm -hmm. donut. I know you also do UGC obviously. Yeah. But, you know, you've been posting a lot of sick ads you've made for brands like Obvi. So take us through that process of coming up with uh, with ads. Yeah, um, for us, like, of course, I have my creative strategy team. Uh, I can tell a bit about it, of course. Um, but for us, it starts with with the research. Like we, of course, with the use of ChatGPT, we can use a lot of like these prompts to generate through all of the reviews that customers provide us. So when we start with a brand, we always ask them to give us like a CSV of their reviews. And with that, we have a lot of ammunition to find the angles that are most common amongst their buyers and find like which, uh, which angles like are most common in their, in their overall customer list, which really helps us craft those angles that we can tackle with the ads and see like, ah, oh, like this came up like 20 times during all of these customer, like reasons why they bought the product or we'll check uh, in triple oil. You can actually go into the post-purchase survey. We'll set up like post-purchase survey questions. Why, why did you make a purchase today? And we'll list out the main reasons why we think, and you can also make like an other, um, um, option where people can mm -hmm. fill in what they want because why they bought the product and that really helps us find like uh, why are people actually buying products and in that survey you can see like oh 30 percent filled in this way so we'll use that to find like uh, the best angles that can work for our ads and that and like the research ultimately like what starts like that creative flywheel and based on that of course you'll look at the data you'll start running the ads and you'll see um, which ads are getting dispensed and from there you can just iterate and go from there. Um, but I would say like for us recently in the last year, like that uh, entire process with chat GPT and, um, post-purchase survey data is just really powerful. And I would advise everybody to do it. Um, of course, if you have the right prompts, the, the right questions to ask, but it's fairly simple. You can, yeah, every person with a brain can think like, oh, what, what should I ask chat GPT to, um, to get the right answers. And 
how do you determine what creative type you're going to run for a client, right? So if a client comes to you, how do you know if, you, if it's better for them to do UGC, better for them to do, you know, statics, carousels? Like, how do you go through that? Yeah, I would always say like test um, and you'll get the right answer. Um, usually a good media mix. If you look at all the successful brands, um, you will see their media mix uh, and see how many ads they're running are static ads, how many ads they're video ads. And of course, like not, not copy a, a brand, but I would say for every brand, I would say test it. But in the beginning for, let's say you're a starter brand, I would say start out very simple with static ads. You can quickly test angles. Um, it's not very expensive to produce static ads. You can just whip it up yourself, um, use the templates or <laughs> make it yourself in Canva. Uh, it's very, very easy, of course, to to make a simple static ad compared to like a video, or if you're very comfortable on camera, you can record it yourself if you're a startup founder. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, for us, like when starting out, like go start with statics and see which angles are converting best, uh, try some different concepts. And from there, you can inform your video creatives of which, um, which angles are converting. But if you're already like a, a brand doing seven, eight or nine figures, like you, you need to have a good media mix of mm -hmm. different types of videos and within static and videos, you will still have different types as well. Like you can just not say like, ah, I'm just doing UGC, but UGC is very broad. Like what is a UGC? Like ultimately mm -hmm. like, um, you will need to have different types of styles, videos, like mashups, um, customer testimonies, unboxings, and then you can create like endless amounts of videos if you have the right content. And with statics, it's, it's, it's the same for us. It's, um, yeah, it's very simple to, to whip up, but of course you need to write the inspiration as well to come up with the ideas. And, uh, if you have a product render, you can make a static and yeah, it's, it's fairly, um, cost effective to, to start with statics, I would say. So starting brand owners, your recommendation is to either start with statics because for it's cost efficient, plus yeah. probably faster for them to make, or if they're comfortable, do videos themselves do I'll put that in big quote. I mean, it's not, I won't even call it UGC, but do founder led videos if you want. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, once they've tested winning angles, start hiring creators, do more UGC, do more videos, motion graphics and such. Yeah, 100%. And also we've seen one brand that we just started working with. They went to like 30 or 50k a month by one mid journey generated video. Um, mm. It's 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 crazy. Like those videos can work as well. You don't need assets. You just generate some images in mid journey, uh, add an AI voiceover with 11 labs and you have a video, um, especially for supplements, et cetera. I see that working really well. Um, if you're a US based brand, UK based brand also start out with TikTok shop. I would uh, suggest to get mm -hmm. a bunch of good content, give the affiliates commission and from there, just scale up that whole production. Uh, if you can do commission only deals, you just need to, um, yeah, uh, cover the, the cogs of course, and shipping out the product. Uh, I think sometimes TikTok will cover it as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's just a powerful way of also getting a bunch of content. And if a piece of content takes off, you'll make money and the creator gets money as well. So win, win in that scenario. Love it. And going back to what you said earlier, right? I know you said you use motion app. And I also said you, like you have sometimes, like I think all of us fall in prey to making more creatives rather than focusing on quality, but like quality is still the main focus. So do you track something like creative hit rate or efficiency? Meaning like when you work with a client, how do you make sure to balance out the total ads you make for them versus the actual winning ads? And then do you try and increase like that score internally, if that makes sense? Yeah, we'll always aim for the highest hit rate, of course. Um, sometimes it's a bit harder, uh, especially if there's no proven process before. Like, for example, like it's a startup brand that uh, hasn't had any success, then uh, it's hard to uh, come in and uh, try and make something that hasn't worked before. But definitely 100% will track what, uh, what, what the hit rate is and always try to improve it. Um, of course, there are like certain variables that are uh, impacted like or that impact the performance of the ads as well outside of your control because recently like meta has been a bit buggy and then of course the hit rate will always go down but definitely we'll always look at like how many creators are producing and how many are a success and what did we learn from those creatives and how can we improve like the overall uh, creative flywheel that we have and build out that system for clients that that pumps out those creators at scale and from there just see like ah um, every one out of 10 videos or statics will be a winner or can eat up like 
fifty percent of the spend. Um, so ultimately, that's that's what we aim for. But yeah, um, it's always easy said than done, uh, as you know it as well from experience. Um, mm -hmm. Most of your ads will obviously fail, um, yeah. and that's uh, just something not a lot of people are prepared, uh, especially like founders. If you start working with them, like if you say to them, like most of the ads that we'll make will actually fail. And they, yeah. are, are, are we working with a bunch of amateurs here? Or <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I mean, if you're lucky two, two or three out of 10 ads, like at best, you know, are going are gonna to yeah. perform and oh, that's, mm. that's that. And then how do you, um, cause now I know you've been working with bigger and bigger brands, uh, as, as you've grown and a video I've made not long ago is I had, a when I was in Dubai, I met up with one of our clients and we had this chat mm -hmm. where it, it kind of hit me where I thought every brand that we've ever worked with that stopped working with us. Um, and I, I analyzed most of these brands and none of them really took off, like dramatically blew up. They usually mm -hmm. stayed stable, perhaps even stopped the business. And I was like, most of our best case studies, I think the brand would have blown up regardless of our involvement. I just think we either sped up that trajectory and I still think they want a good trajectory. So going back to you, now that you've increased client quality, do you feel like it's easier to get creatives that just stick with these brands because they've built something so strong already? Yeah, if you already have a brand spending like six figures a month on ads, it's ultimately easier compared to like a brand spending a couple hundred bucks a day. Like it will be ultimately very hard to, or not very hard, but harder compared to like a bigger brand to find winners. Um, obviously, they have more data and... You also have more data for your inputs. Like you will have tons of customers that you can go through in the reviews to find like which angles are working best and why they're buying your product. So there's ultimately more, uh, yeah, more of like a proof of process, uh, proof of concept, of course, for them to just yeah. um, elevate and get that creative hit rate up. So yeah, I've definitely been noticing that. And I feel the same that you just mentioned, like the brands that stopped working with us, like haven't really seen any really took mm -hmm. off and uh yeah that's a funny thing 100 percent yeah. feel that no exactly it's a, it's like putting the ego aside for a second as an agency owner like it, it really is is as we both said it's like hey i i've proved me wrong right like i hope to be proven wrong someday but i just never seen a brand dramatically blow up after and thinking like damn like maybe we weren't the right fit it's like the brand just always stalled for the most part and then on the flip side as you said i think there's a lot to do with the founder with the brand positioning the timing mm -hmm. in the market but on the flip side, and I, I've got my answers and my thoughts about that that's a question, but I'm curious to hear you. Do you think like good or the best creatives in the world, do you think they can make up for either a bad product or a poor organic presence or poor conversion rate? How much of an impact do you think good creatives have, let's say, in, in the entire funnel? Yeah, I think it can. Um, but... It will bite you in the ass after because if you have mm -hmm. a bad product, people will not come back and your business will will fill, in my opinion. Like if you like, of course, you can get the first sale in if you can make a product look good and have ads that promise the world. But in the end, you'll deliver like nothing. Um, so I think, yeah, you can, but it's not like very sustainable over the long run. Um, you mm -hmm. want to make sure the foundations are right. And from there. And create ads that actually provide value and promise the customer something that that they're actually going to get, um, compared to like having a bunch of good ads but actually shit products. Um, that that won't be, in my opinion, that's not a very sustainable way of doing business. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. And going, uh, I'm telling you up on another subject from earlier, which was uh, TikTok. Right? We talked about the shelf life of creatives on TikTok versus Facebook as a platform. Based on brand size, like where do you feel a brand should go to? Um, I know you've said like small brands, it might be good if they're in the US or UK to get started on TikTok for TikTok shop. Um, but like what platform do you see working best for different brand sizes? You mean like Meta and TikTok? Like when yeah. when they should go to TikTok? Exactly. Or or Meta, right? So like when when is the right time for a brand to do so? Yeah, for TikTok, to be honest, I would recommend a brand to stick to Meta like for the first like like I would say like 100K in revenue a month. Like if you get there, mm -hmm. then start exploring TikTok. Obviously with the comp with the surge of TikTok shop, um, uh, I would say that number uh, has gone down, especially for brands that are suitable for the platform. It can really help them find scale very fast. If you can really nail down TikTok shop and the whole volume with the affiliate uh, network. And yeah, just if the product is right, like below $50, a good purchase um, is 
the product looks great. Um, it's very easy to, to buy then. Yeah, your product is right for TikTok shop and you can really get a lot of skill through that. But ultimately in the beginning, I would say you need focus, like go on Meta, have a couple of campaigns or one campaign and just test a bunch of stuff. Um, and from there, just, just skill and get to six figures a month in revenue and then start exploring TikTok, for example. Um, so I would say like, um, that's from, from me, um, if I would start a brand, I would do it that way. Would you say people or are, are often overcomplicating it? Like as an example, like spending too much too early on too many platforms. Yeah, I hear it all the time. Like brands coming to me, like ah, oh, like let's let's start on Meta, let's start on TikTok, let's do this and that. And then I say like, oh, calm down, let's start on one platform, <laughs> get it going, uh, be profitable there, and then move yeah. to the next one. Because if you don't have focus, you'll 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 lose it. Yeah. Yeah. I think Hermosi said that mostly for like agencies and, and, you know, like info businesses where she was like one product, one offer, one channel, 1 million, um, mm -hmm. which she was like to get yourself there and then, uh, then start exploring, which is kind of in line with what you're saying at hundred K a month, which is roughly 1.2 million a year. Um, if 1.2 million a year, you're advertising solely on Facebook ads and you've really crushed it there then it's yeah. the time to start exploring other platforms. Yeah, they, like I think it's just like they see dollar signs and they see like oh, this brand popping up on TikTok. I must do that as well. And just like yeah. uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, <laughs> social media just elevated that. Yeah, mm -hmm. FOMO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of FOMO everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to that, and I know this is going to be like a very broad topic, but I'm just curious to hear you on like the importance of creatives. Like as we go, uh, one thing I've seen a lot is you know, I'm more meta than I am TikTok, right? Like full yeah. transparency. Most of my ad spend is on meta. Um, mm -hmm. And we, you know, meta is pushing advantage plus shopping campaigns, right? So they're also pushing like when you want to, now it's like audience suggestions. Even if you try and go against that, they'll tell you like three different times, like we'll still reach the people above and beyond. Like it's super hard to limit the audience. I don't yeah. do it anymore, but I'm saying that because so many people commenting on the videos or listening to us right now are probably thinking, well, I still do targeting. I still think interests work. I still think lookalikes. But I personally see platforms going broad. I personally see like AI becoming a big play into targeting and account structures. And I think the established brands can all agree about that. So mm -hmm. touch a little bit on the importance of creatives, I think, and how you know agencies like yours are, are the key to a brand success. Yeah, I mean, like you said, like it's becoming more and more simple. And with creatives, you can just determine your targeting. Like uh, we've... Um, We've actually tested it. Like we've done some really like older uh, people like messaging in our ads, and we immediately saw Facebook spending the majority of the budget on like fifty five plus. Like, mm -hmm. and we showed it to the client, and they they would I think they weren't really convinced of like ah uh, like uh, we should do interest or um, mm -hmm. we uh, the creators won't do the targeting. Why are you not doing any interest targeting or lookalikes? And then we just prove it to them like. If we put this in our creatives and our ad copy, um, aligning our ad copy and creative messaging with this audience that we're trying to target, which an older audience, we will target an older audience. Um, so that's how powerful it is. And you'll see it if you want to target a specific angle, you will obviously, um, with your creatives and of course your corresponding ad copy, you will target that piece of the audience where back in 2017 or before that, you would just do interest targeting. For example, you're selling a weight loss product and uh, you wanted to target like people that are in, interested in weight loss that would crush it, um, obviously make it very easy. But uh, right now it's just become harder, um, but I won't necessarily like worse. Like it's ultimately better because it will separate the bad advertisers from the good advertisers. And for us as a creative agency, it just helps us um, accelerate that growth for the need of creatives that are actually speaking to a specific set of audience where previously you could just like maybe hack your way into like a specific audience. Right now it's really down to the creatives and the quality of the creatives. Love it. And have you, I'm just curious to ask you as a side question, are you purely working with e-commerce brands? Have you ever touched a local business space or not at all? Now we are diving a bit uh, outside of e-com right now with some uh, actually one brand that we work with is like a like a trading platform and nice. uh, some 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 lead generation right now. Um, so it's a bit a bit outside e-com as well right now. Because I think it's been it's been increasingly um, interesting if you want to look at these local business spaces because I still think that they're often behind what's happening in the e-com space. E-com is such you know widespread. Mm -hmm. It's such it's made at a much bigger scale. 
they're usually first to experience these market changes. Like any new app platform, you know, changes or techniques, like these guys are the first ones to be victims of it. But um, I'm saying that because I know a lot of people also watching the channel are local business advertisers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recommend that they, you know, check out guys like you as an example and check out the types of ads that you make and, and bring that to local business spaces. Because, mm -hmm. man, if you would look yeah, at the quality there, it's it's atrocious. We've, uh, recently started working with um with a postcard company that does like nice. postcards and uh, the the owner specifically of that that business asked us to do D2C inspired postcards. Uh, mm. and that's something that we've done recently and I think uh, we have yet to see the results but something like that is uh, exactly what we're just touching on like mm. bringing that D2C element to local businesses and if you can really do that as as you said that, like they're kind of behind like the whole strategy as we see it as well like Ecom and like local businesses and right I'm from Europe I'm from the Netherlands and the trends in the US are always more in front of like Europe and it will come overseas it's always funny to see like, those those shifts happening and it's it's the same with local businesses and uh, D2C 100% and, uh, it's good to uh, bridge that gap between the both worlds I think as a French Canadian you know it's it's I'm in a part of Canada that is like unlike the rest of Canada and that said <laughs> same as you I think big this, this is a big opportunity that i see for a lot of foreigners which oftentimes um i hear like french canadians or europeans too which i'm sure you hear which are like i want to build a brand i want to expand to the us i'm like do you do you know how competitive that market is what if yeah. you just looked at what the us does bring that locally you'll fucking crush it like you'll crush everybody here if you can implement us stuff locally mm -hmm. so yeah yeah, yeah. It's just uh, about the claims you can make in the US. It's uh, quite uh, quite broad. I'm not sure how Canada is, but uh, in Europe, there's a lot of regulations that, especially in like health supplements, like the claims yeah. they're making in the US are just outrageous. And if you do it in Europe, like <laughs> you'll get crushed by the uh, local authorities. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing here, especially here, I'd say the financial claims are like the biggest difference mm -hmm. between the US. Financial businesses yeah, yeah. are so much more regulated in Canada. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the US, like I've seen businesses doing instant forms. And anyways, they're asking crazy questions. And I'm like, yo, you probably go to jail if you ask those here. So. <laughs> but yeah. uh, a, a point I wanted to bring up also was um, something I sometimes discuss on the channel. So I personally have a background in design. And that's where like my studies, my, my uh, college like degree, everything is in design on my side. And I think one thing that you've nailed is like the looks of the designs too. Oftentimes, people like myself, more specifically, and other uh, uh, people like on YouTube and on Twitter, they speak a lot about the uh, consumer psychology, the marketing fundamentals, which obviously is all great because I feel that makes a, a fundamentally sound ad. But I think a good looking ad is, is equally important, like making an ad, it really stands out. Um, I, how do you guys come up with like such good looking creatives? Like, how do you make creatives that, you know, pop? Do you have a process for that? Do you follow specific rules or like? How does your mm -hmm. team come up with these? Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of research in the beginning, like I mentioned. Uh, also, like you need to have a good have a, have a good looking brand. Like that's uh, always something I say. Like if you have a brand that's just black and white, like for us, it will be very hard to make like a very good looking ad. Of course, it's still possible if you have good branding, but you have like these colors that pop. We have some brands that have really like popping colors and have some amazing branding. Uh, but yeah, for us, it's just research. We use Atria for ad inspiration. Um, and that just really helps us to find um, inspiration. Of course, we don't like to copy it, but of course, sometimes we'll see a concept. Like let's say we are going to make ads for a supplement brand and we look inside the fashion niche. We'll see like a concept. Oh, we can use this for a supplement brand. Um, and we just like, cross test it and of course right now we're working with around 30 brands and we see like one concept working for this brand and like we can use that for another brand so it really helps us like um spark new ideas and of course my team does research they go on reddit forums um they yeah they uh, they search the internet and from there just find the right ads that they think that can work for our brands and our, our designers will take that um, we'll write a brief for them and they execute it and from there we'll uh, go back and forth uh, of course that process can be longer depending on the brand um, sometimes it can take like a week to make sure we have the right creators but once we get those confirmed um, we'll make sure that those are um, visually appealing but sometimes you want to create ugly ads that are very ugly and um, will look more native so 
there's um with static ads it's always like a mixture of uh, having some high quality images some scrappy ones and, and just having a good mix of uh, different um, different messaging as well because like you like i just mentioned the messaging is very important as well if you can combine it with really good visuals um and it can be painful sometimes if you mm-hmm. search online and you see an ad running what are trying to be a very good visual uh, image and then it's just like it's not there and then you mm-hmm. think like ah oh, this is really bad executed and then mm-hmm. yeah it can be very painful sometimes if you see a bad design ad and you think you think yourself ah oh, it can be so much better and how do you not go too deep into that meaning like there, I feel like there's a lot of brands sometimes that fall prey to the branding fallacy which is like I need this to be branded. Like I need this to look like our branding guidelines. I need this to look with these colors and that. And you're like, well, it might look better or perform better if you did this. Like, how do you balance branding the performance? Yeah, it's always the debate of like branding and like direct response. Like Mm -hmm. I'm more on the direct response uh, type of way in terms of like how I learned like advertising. Of course, branding is very important as well. Um, and, And it helps 100%. Um, yeah, for us, it's just about like making a good balance of like having usually when the branding needs to be very much on point, your messaging even needs to be stronger because usually it will mean like the ad will be very polished and might not be that much direct response, but ultimately it's something that you want to evoke into people like clicking on the ad and making a purchase. And sometimes with highly polished ads that not always possible um and if you have a more scrappy ad you can be more direct response which might lead to more sales and some brands are just um very very much tied to their brand and they don't want to don't want to hurt their brand which does make sense um but sometimes it's brands that are making like five figures a month like doing 10k a month for example and they are afraid like ah this hurt my brand but Mm-hmm. They don't even have a brand. They're yeah, just exactly. doing some uh, some small numbers. So if you have a brand doing like seven, eight, nine figures, yeah, makes sense. But yeah, uh, it needs to be the right timing for your uh, for your brand to uh, be very, very like uh, picky about your brand and how the ads will look. Uh, because but even then, yeah, because you said like seven, eight, nine figures. Speak. Of, let's say I, I've seen some of the ads you made for Obvi as an example, right? Uh, Obviously, you see the pink in these ads, so you have like the iconic Obvi pink. So that's could be argued to be tied to the brand. But I know you've experienced with some like Mid Journey or Dali or whatever, like AI generated images for these mm-hmm. guys. I know you experienced with a lot of things that I'm sure many smaller brands would claim like, oh, this is out of brand. Like this is just not us. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, and I, I guess I'm just saying this to to show like the audience that even like big brands are still open to yeah. try new ideas and to make stuff that just performs. Yeah, and it will not be shown to the entirety of the country. Like it will only be shown to a couple thousand people. And if it doesn't work, you kill it. Like it won't hurt your brand. Like that's how mm-hmm. I feel about it. Just test it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it really scales, then yeah, you'll you'll make some money. Like what's there to lose? Yeah. True. Yeah. Agreed uh, agreed uh, with that. <laughs> um With that said, are there any things that we didn't touch on today? I'm trying to think like this is mostly everything I wanted to bring up with you. Are there any specific topics you wanted to go into? Do we wrap things up? Um, Yeah, I think we touched about everything. Yeah, Um, I think, um, yeah, I think um, the likes of TikTok shop, uh, we might not have touched on like entirely, Um, but uh, that's something we're also... Yeah, we can. Yeah, that's something we're um, t- uh, testing out more and more with the agency as well, TikTok Shop, mm. which uh, is definitely something that's up and coming and um, has a, a lot of potential for a lot of brands and something we see like, oh, that's it can generate a lot of revenue if you do it right. So yeah, that that's just something we're testing out with a lot of brands right now, or not a lot of brands, a couple of brands in like a beta program at our agency. Um, so that's just something that's uh, really interesting. And I think if you have a brand in the US, UK, and I think some other markets that are out there that uh, it is available to, then definitely I would explore it as uh, it's, uh, it's work um, to set it up. And it's a lot of maintenance, but if you can find the right systems, um, also, connecting it through like the likes of incense where you can do like mm. product seeding campaigns and connecting that through TikTok shop can be really valuable. And there are of course other ways to do it yeah. as well. Yeah. But then one thing, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Cause that's, that's one thing about TikTok shop that it's been putting me a little bit on my heels, which is 
Triple Well's report for 2023 was that the average order value on TikTok was, I think, $42. Meta was like 92 bucks. So we mm -hmm. both know that you cannot sell as expensive of a product on TikTok because, as you said, you need yeah. something that's kind of that has this kind of trendy slash fast action vibe. Like you need to, you, you cannot really think about making a buying decision. You have to, it's like an impulse buy. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a lower priced product and there's quite high fees also on TikTok shop as a brand. Like you have a pretty steep percentage to give to TikTok on that order. So then you have smaller product price, you have thinner margins. How does a brand financially make TikTok work? I guess is the question well, I keep it's the same, asking. Same as Amazon. Amazon has like a pretty high, high, high fees as well. So I would yeah, compare sure. it to Amazon as well. So sure. I wouldn't say those fees are a big issue, but uh, yeah, um, I would say the chance of having success on TikTok shop, uh, like I said, the product below like $50, $60, then yeah, uh, if it's ex more expensive than that, we still make it work. We have a brand like uh, average order value is around like 100, 150, and we still do some good numbers on TikTok shop. So uh, product can definitely work. Um, so yeah, it's a case by case scenario, you know, um, mm -hmm. and in the end, it's about testing. I would say that and uh, testing out to see if it can work for your brand. But uh, if you're, uh, we have a brand selling saunas, but uh, I wouldn't see that working on TikTok shop. Probably not. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably no, no. Te yeah, testing, but in intelligently. Like you, you want to make sure you're smart about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. But uh, as you said, I guess yeah, it is similar to, the, to Amazon. And there's also, I mean, TikTok has been adding so many more native search capabilities on the platform, so it is becoming more oh. and more like an all-in-one platform for consuming content, shopping, um, and more. Um, I yeah, I guess I'm just. If we compare it to Amazon, then I see it more as one channel, part of the whole bunch. But I do still think that because something that, that that's bugged me, I guess, about the stats I saw from uh, Triple Wall was that the, um, the demographic of e-commerce brands that saw the best results were, I think, zero to one million a year. And uh, with also the share, like, again, AOV, which was quite low AOV. And I was thinking drop shipping. I'm like. Who's doing zero to one million? Who has the capacity to have a fast, like that rapidly change products and to not necessarily operate on the cleanest margins? A drop shipper, like they, they they can make it work. So I'm just thinking from an established brand's perspective again, long term. I I well, haven't, yeah, yeah. I would say TikTok is also like a more of like a, I say this sometimes like it's 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 like a TV. Like people will go on TikTok to watch TV more, and it's about only presence if your brand doing. Uh, eight nine figures then tiktok can be really valuable but don't expect the same row as compared to facebook like Agreed. it's 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 different how users behave there like they go on tiktok to like scroll and what like kind of the same as tv or watching youtube like uh, mm -hmm. your youtube row as compared to your google row as will also be like totally different and you have to like look at it as a as a whole blended approach uh, especially if you're doing numbers then tiktok may might make sense but don't try to uh, copy the same ROAS that you have on on Meta. For sure. And what about attribution on TikTok? I guess I'm going to wrap things up with this. I personally have, like, thank God for Triple Wall, to be honest, because personally, if I'm ever looking at TikTok, it's always ugly. For the most part, like, I've never seen TikTok native ROAS. I, th I say that, I've probably seen it twice. Native cool. ROAS doing yeah. very good. But Triple Wall is always, like, miles different. I'll look at TikTok, it'll tell me 1.5. I'll look at triple wall, it'll tell me like 3.5. So mm -hmm. have you seen that too? Have you seen attribution being out of whack natively to TikTok? Yeah, and uh, of course you have different attribution windows. Uh, you True. have uh, your triple attribution uh, window, you have total impact, which uh, doesn't make sense for, for some brands. Sometimes we'll see a lot of overlap, then we'll switch to like a different attribution window. So one funny little thing we saw for um, a brand doing nine figures who are managing the TikTok ads for uh, is that once we ramp TikTok up um, and spending like five figures a day on TikTok, we immediately saw Google results just skyrocket because people mm. were searching like on Google for that brand. And they yeah, they saw like a much better Google um, Google results in the results of us activating TikTok, but the TikTok ROAS was still profitable, not like the same as Meta, slightly below it, but it was contributing the, to the overall growth of the business. And that um, does show like, uh, don't just look at the TikTok ROAS in TikTok, in Triple Will, but also look at like how are the other um, platforms impacted by For it sure. and how are they working together? Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, that's definitely something to consider as well when uh, yeah. starting 
to the running TikTok or you're already running TikTok but not aware of it to make sure to look at it like a from a, like a helicopter point of view. Yeah, we've been doing that with one of our meal replacement companies where like TikTok or a triple wall, I should say, has like the activity feed feature where you can benchmark two mm -hmm. metrics. You're like TikTok spend to Google ROAS and then you can see whether or not this has like a positive impact. So I mm -hmm. agree with you there. I think even if TikTok natively and triple wall doesn't necessarily look the best, look at whether or not it has a positive impact on other areas of the business. That yeah, I like it. If, if you see that, like people searching the brand, like after um, they've seen you on TikTok, try to mm. amend your creative. So what we've done for that brand, we mentioned their brand name in the creatives because mm. we we saw like uh, like if they search on Google, competitors will also pop up. So mm. that's something that you want to make sure of in your creatives, like mention the brand name. So when they Google you, they will see like, oh, I saw this in this ad. I'm going to their website because I saw their, their brand name and not the competitors. Well, I'm not going to name that brand, but I believe I know what brand you're talking about. But I've seen one of your creatives that you just keep flashing the brand logo like super quick mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. you do the ad. And I don't know if you know which brand I'm talking about, but like just the brand logo keeps on flashing like for a split second. Is that something you do with like a lot of clients or no? Uh, not a lot. Like sometimes yeah. we'll do it, um, but uh, it's just like an editing style. Yeah, because I, I do yeah. think that, as you said, for like brand recognition, and to just mm -hmm. prompt people to think, like associate this style, the yeah. brand name, and just keep searching more of the brand, mm -hmm. I th that probably works great. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, love it. Awesome, man. Now to wrap things up, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, about Creative Donut, perhaps even buy, you know, some of the products that you have? Yeah, for sure. Um, find me on Twitter, um, just Dennis Willebortse. Um, You can find me on Twitter. Um, check out the Creative Donut templates. Um, we're launching the third pack soon as well. I uh, got two oh. packs right now. You can get uh, two of them at 30% off. So you get, uh, it's 50 templates at, uh, yeah, a fraction of the cost. Um, so that's uh, that. That's something you can check us out. And of course, my advertising agency where we help brands with uh, creating a creative flywheel machine to help them uh, generate some, uh, some more revenue with our uh, creatives. So that's, uh, that's where you can find me. Awesome, man. Well, Dennis, thank you for hopping on and uh, we'll hope to see you back on the channel soon. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Cool.